So in the spirit of the conference uh, theme, I'm going to try something stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed, this is it. We made this, this thing we call the Anthropocene. As musician and naturalist Bernie Krause writes in his book, The Great Animal Orchestra, a great silence is spreading over the natural world, even as the sound of man is becoming deafening. But as Guattari writes, the implications of any given negative development may or may not be catastrophic. At the same time, however, we've become accustomed to a vision of the world, this world in which human ingenuity, interventions, and progress have become moral imperatives. The earth has been conflated with a human-centered world, one divided, categorized, and made disparate through all too human regimes of representation. In this world, we have become inflexible. We partition off the real into separate and hierarchical categories in the name of human will and desire. Or as Krause writes, little by little, the vast orchestra of life, the chorus of the natural world, is in the process of being quietened. In this world, we have destroyed and neutralized ecological thought. That is, we have quashed the ability to think in terms of relations in the name of common sense, consensus, and accord. The task facing us as we spin into the future is not one of producing agreement and unity, but one of dissensus. We must dissent. We must stutter. In this presentation, I hope to investigate... Hey, hang on, wait a, minute. wait a minute. We need to stop here. We need to stop and talk about this thing you're calling the Anthropocene. It's not my term. The term was kind of coined by Eugene Sturmer to name the era marked by growing evidence for the effects of human... The destructive, violent, unequally distributed effects. Yes, the catastrophic effects of human activities on the Earth. Naming the Anthropocene may be helpful for catalyzing interdisciplinary discourse on climate change and eco-catastrophe, but this naming merely provides a compensatory charge, a call for redemption, aimed at reducing the unpleasant and often unfathomable effects of anthropogenic climate change. So this is where I'm hoping to go as I continue. The term Anthropocene just works to reify a not-so-new set of grand narratives, a new form of naive universalism, where the individual human is, once again, valorized as the hero of the story. I hear you, and I agree. We are left with yet another story of human exceptionalism, where humans take take center stage as the theater crumbles around us. The Anthropocene fails to articulate the paradox of this all too human situation. This is what I'm trying to get at. On the one hand, the continuous development of human-made techno-scientific interventions have provided us with all sorts of knowledge that claims to provide evidence of impending eco-catastrophe. While on the other hand, there is a distinct feeling that contemporary social forces, constituted political formations, are unable to take hold of these things and actually make them We are all climate change deniers. We have no grasp of the collective character. The anthropos of the Anthropocene, the human of the human-made catastrophe. We feel guilty for a crime we are not responsible for, at least not by ourselves. Yeah, I recycle. I buy uh, sustainable cat litter. I even buy local Indeed, stuff. humans made this, but we don't know what to do. And Anthropocene discourse does little to address this gap. The gap between human scales and hyper-objectified climate between change. Between humans and scientific knowledge. Between humans and technology. Or how this human-made catastrophe is made possible by our human technophilia narcissism, the idea that man invented himself, the ultimate technical innovation. From the liberation of earth-locked oil to the manipulation of chemical, genetic, and atomic processes, the transformation of ecologies for agricultural production and resource extraction, the materiality of the planet has become transformed in relation to its meaning, utility, and aesthetic reference for us. And I wouldn't just stop with agricultural and industrial technological interventions. What we really need to focus on are busted political and economic technologies. We need to talk about globalized petrol Yeah, so I was just going to say, notice how this term, the Anthropocene, obtained real purchase in popular and scientific discourse in the context of trying to manage this thing we call globalization. We can't just point to man as some sort of god of the Anthropocene or technology writ large, but the very particular political and economic structures that have come to define the circulation of bodies and ideas on this planet. The real, the, real name, the real name for this epoch is not the Anthropocene, but the Capitalocene. Delusions of unfettered and continuous growth made possible by the continued appropriation of cheap natures is what led us here. And with the inevitable depletion of these resources, capitalism, the ultimate difference engine, needs to create new cheap or cheapened natures. Exactly, and this is happening now, all around us. Cheap nature as an accumulation strategy works by opening new opportunities for investment. Let's say by running pipelines through unceded indigenous lands and risking contamination of water supplies in the process. This converts the of crises is not just created by our humanist technophilia narcissism, but the inherent violence, exploitation, and necessary division between nature and culture that has been created and maintained by capitalism itself. But we mustn't collapse everything into the figure of capital, as doing so runs the risk of ignoring new information. Exactly. 
The real, the, real, the real name for this epoch should be the plantation scene. An era marked by ongoing enclosures of the commons and heavy reliance on slave labor and other forms of exploited, alienated, and usually spatially transported or labor. Or maybe the plantation scene is also too reliant on human-made concepts. Does it adequately recognize the agency of multi-species models that constitute our humanness in the first place? So you're arguing for a valorization of lived experience, embodied ways of knowing, a focus on effective domains. And why not? The Anthropocene raises new questions about our intraspecies relations and performative reality. Our time is marked by a haunting awareness of the breach between <coughs> human logos and other ways of knowing. Bodily ways of knowing. Multi-species ways of knowing. Okay, but while the Anthropocene etymologically refers to the age of humans, the reversal of human interest in Teloea commences suggests a concomitant era of misanthropic subtraction. The, the misanthropocene. Even embodied practices put into question the orthodoxies of human conceptual systems and modes of knowing because what we are confronted with now is the emergence of occulted worlds that are not resemblant to the world presumed by us, by humans. So we have the anthropocene, the capitalocene, the plantationocene, the misanthropocene. I've also heard of the Eurocene. A recognition that it was the European elite that developed a distinctively mechanistic view of matter and oppositional relation to nature and an economic system indebted to geographic or the Anthropocene, where media live on in the layer of toxic waste we'll leave behind as our geological legacy. Or the Beta Scene, the time to test, engage, and experiment with new ways of being in the world and with Don't the world. Don't forget the Cthulhu Scene, Haraway's proposal to think in terms of tentacular entanglements and divergent temporalities, spatialities that include the more than human, other than human, inhuman, and human as humus. So we have the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, the Anthropocene, the Eurocene, the Anthropocene, the Beta Scene, the Cthulhu the Okay, okay, you're right, you're all right. Naming is important, naming can make us think, but we must recognize that naming the question a question, of the yes, the question of the Anthropocene is different than naming, defining the terms of an answer. Such a definition only gives us the last word. Anthropocene. Instead, we need to learn to compose with many names, many knowledges, many practices, and with acute awareness and humility in relation to the limits of our all-too-human logos. Naming is a risk. But naming also focuses our attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Apparently, the need to pay attention is common knowledge. And yet, once we get talking about development Growth. or innovation, the injunction is above all to not pay attention. Again, this is where I'm hoping to go. If you, so I'm going to finish the introduction. We must reclaim the art of paying attention. Pay attention to this. What truths, what systems of knowledge, what universes of value do we create, recreate, or dismiss when we pay attention or not? These are just some of the questions that will unfold as I continue the conversation. While we're on the topic, can we discuss candidly, seriously, what we need to be paying attention to, the so-called truths, the systems of knowledge, and the epistemological errors that have come to define our Anthropocene situation. I thought we weren't using the Anthropocene. Anthropocene, Anthropocene capitalism, capitalism, Pay attention to this. Pay attention to the knowledge of our impending extinction. Are we really concerned with the death of all those species? The entirely tortoise, the Pyrenean ibex, the golden toad. Are we not just concerned with our own death as a species? The human species. We must pay attention to our grim situation. Reality check. The the world is still miles off, meaning it's 2030 carbon target emissions, or emission targets. According to Gaia hypothesis... Not his. What about Lynn Margulis? Why is she always left out of the picture? Okay, Lovelock and Margulis' Gaia hypothesis, you know, how organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings on Earth to form a synergistic, self-regulating complex system that helps to maintain and perpetuate the conditions of life on this planet. Yeah, that one. It's not really up to us. If there are too many people for the Earth to support, Gaia will find a way to get rid of the excess and carry on. And we do this doomsaying with cheer. When the climate when the crisis finally breaks, this is when we can put our petty human differences aside and our species will be able to pull together to just make things work. Okay, and when is this break supposed to happen? By break, do you mean break? B-R-A-K-E? Do you mean our unfettered hope as a break? An inconstant pleasure arising from the image of something future or past? Where the pressing challenges of the present are obscured in the name of historical exemplification and unbridled hope for the future? Indeed, some might say that this confounding cheerfulness is just another form of jouissance, that intense pleasure-pain couplet of enjoyment enjoyment that makes life worth living and some things worth dying Climate for. change is just another vehicle for liberal jouissance. A current of left anthropocenic enjoyment. An instrument for reveling in destruction, punishment, and ultimately knowing. Pay attention. Pay attention to this. To what? To our enjoyment or to our inevitable demise? The challenge here is not just about saving species on the verge of extinction, and overcoming food shortages, or even redirecting energy markets towards more sustainable means and ends, but instead about posing challenges to our sense of what it means to be a human here and now. To put it bluntly, if we want to learn to 
live in the Anthropocene, we must first learn how to die. If we as human beings are to survive the coming annihilations, it will be a survival in a world unrecognizably different from the one we have inhabited. Perhaps we are wired to believe that tomorrow will be better than today. But I'm not so sure this belief can last forever. Indeed, the reality... The real material conditions created by climate change... ...are going to keep intruding on our fantasies of perpetual growth, of unbridled innovation. The intrusion of climate change of Gaia is not the intrusion of a vulnerable nor exploitable Earth, but instead an indifferent being that signifies no afterwards. Pay attention. Not only that, but we are now confronting the emergence of an entirely new form of evolution that is, according to some, one million times faster than the old processes Darwinian natural selection. And so we have prognostications of the evolution of man-machine hybrids and tales of redemptive technological innovations. Computing power has doubled every two years or something like that, and our current popular revelations around the black mirrors that surround us have fed imaginations, cyborg possibilities, and threats. Pay attention. Pay attention. Can technology save us? Elon Musk sure seems to think so. Our billionaire savior and his new integrative solar products. Integrated into his electric car and home battery products. It's right? just one example of how high-tech innovations only reproduce the same old narrative where human creativity and ingenuity saves the day. With little to no acknowledgement of the way in which capital itself relies on keeping people in specific wage-labor relations. The technology debate is futile and sterile unless we discuss the issue of private the enclosure property. of the commons and the role of capitalist accumulation's reliance on new commodity frontiers. Okay, but these arguments still fail to recognize how technology is not intrinsically linked to fossil fuel capitalism. This relies on the genetic fallacy that just because something was produced within a particular socio-politic framework in the past, it will somehow be irrevocably tainted by this framework in the future. This is what I mean. If we argue that technology can only work in the name of capitalism in its current form, the destructive difference engine that it is, we fail to see how capitalism itself has begun to constrain the productive forces of technology. Or at least direct them towards needlessly narrow ends. Pay attention. Pay attention, pay attention to, to guys. Pay attention, attention to capitalism. Pay attention to technology. Should we not pay more attention to science? And which science are you thinking of here? The great Herculean science? State science? Royal science? Institutionalized science? Scientism. Exactly. Pay attention to the need to defend science against the authority of so-called progress, entrepreneurial distortion, against state initiatives which have been hollowed out in favor of new regimes of management. So pay attention to the tacit authority of scientific knowledge which seems to be given grant or granted a placid value over other ways of Indeed, making sense Indeed, too much scientific and technical research remains <clears throat> wedded to private, most often economic, interests. Science, or more precisely scientism, is deployed in service of continued commodification. It is therefore incapable of reflection, even panicked reflection, because everything, even the demise of worldly environments, is seen as an opportunity. Opp Opportunity for what? For new commodity frontiers. For innovation. For someone else to tell us what is dangerous. What is possible. What is livable. And on the topic of livability, I guess we need to discuss again how we need to pay attention to the other lives implicated in this mess. All of these arguments. Learning to die, technological interventions, critiquing institutionalized science. Focus on our all too human macro political. Big P politics. While obscuring the multi species entanglements, the nodes of relation that happen at the micro political level. What if we zoom in on the micro politics or even the micro biopolitics of our situation and how the the creation of categories of non-human biological agents, as well as the anthropocentric valuation of such agents, offers an idiom for understanding the planetary impasses we now The face. unwritten stories of our entangled relations leave only invisible traces. We must look to the shadowy residue of lost connections to rediscover the hopeful wonder that might be found in the world wide webs of creaturely beings. Pay attention to scale. Pay attention to Pay attention to, to tech. Pay attention to capital. Why don't you just all say what you're really thinking? We are doomed. This is the reality of the situation. Pay this is what we need to pay attention to. Pay attention to doom. How deep down, if you look hard and close, we are all pessimists. But pessimism is the lowest form of philosophy. Pessimism is dismissed as a privileged position, nothing more than a bad attitude. After all, we don't need pessimism like we need optimism. Who has the time? Time for pessimism. Who has the ears? For pessimism it? is too quiet. It operates in size. The lethargy of discontent. But the Anthropocene palpates a mode of pessimism in which we are confronted not just with the vengeance of an anthropomorphized planet, but more horrifically, a planet indifferent to the transcendent status and primacy ascribed to human life in the first place. Pay attention to this. We need to revert from focusing on the prospect of our own species extinction. And pay attention to the emergence of an object, an intrusive guide, that no longer finds equivalency in human creative desire, but rather detaches along unfathomable vectors without, without us. Are you paying attention? I was hoping that this discussion would help us to pay attention, to create a new commons where we come to terms with the idea that no matter what critiques we wage, we have to bear in mind that our responses, responses mustn't be wedded to guarantees in advance, be they of science or some sort of ontology of the political. In terms of climate change, every response, every new creation must acknowledge that it is not venturing into a friendly world, but into an unhealthy milieu. It has to be an experimental era. 
It is this experimentalism that I'm hoping that we can talk Finally, can we talk about actual responses now? If experimentalism is what you're after, we need to develop some actual responses that can be put to the test. Well, to start, we can confront the assertion that responding to impending eco-catastrophe, that trying to save the planet might be just a foolish and romantic extravagance. The only option is to learn to die. And not just learn to die as individuals, but as a civilization. We need to come to terms with the fact that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, and the sooner we can get back to the hard work of adapting to this reality, with humility, the better. But that can't be it. Does this, does this make us feel better? Should we just opt out? Doing nothing is not an option. We need to take seriously the potentials of technology to solve the problem. But techno-science remains a slave to capitalist objectives. Despite technology's potential to produce truly transformative possibilities, the narrow scope of capitalist competition driven by patent wards and monopolization, among other things, has bound our technological and scientific research to the short-sighted aims and goals of capitalist progress. Of course, technology writ large will not save us. There is no tech no utopia, no tomorrow land. Indeed, the techno technology and the political, the social are intimately connected, and so to redirect technology towards more ecological means and ends, we need to accelerate its development beyond the limited purview of capitalist hopes and Accelerate. Dreams. This, is the, real this is the real response. The left must not only become literate in techno-scientific fields, but must strategize in order to take advantage of technological and scientific advances made possible by capitalist society by redirecting them towards truly transformative potentials. But can we not use this same rhetoric to defend ridiculous geoengineering experiments like dispersing sulfuric acid across the stratosphere to create aerosols that reflect sunlight? This is why we must pay attention to scientific expertise. Geophysicists opposed to these measures recognize that such solutions make us feel like we understand what we are doing. But we will never be able to fully predict what hacking the planet with technological interventions will actually do. And even if this works, even if we put our eggs in the basket where technology can save us, these technological interventions fail to acknowledge the reality of our current systems. Our oppressive, depressing, cruel, violent systems. That have left some people reaping the benefits of these so-called opportunities while others pay for it, sometimes with their own lives. Yes, the real response must address the unmanageable levels of climate debt our industrial know-how has already created. Not only that, but imposing new risks to the planet in the name of progress offers just another apologetic, if any, response to capitalism. Your technological optimism just reifies the human is hero story, the same eco-delusion that led us here in the first place. The real response, then? We must go to war. Planetary ecologies and our economic systems are now at war. And so we are faced with the confounding choice of addressing impending eco-catastrophe or changing everything about our current economy economical structures. But even this response fails to recognize how the processes of uneven and combined development are not indicative of some fundamental underlying social dynamic. They are not the cause of the problem of capitalism, and by extension environmental degradation, but rather its effect. The left's orientation around climate justice is unable to bring about system change because it is unable to make historical sense out of the ways in which ecological degradation and discontents are intimately connected to the transformations that have taken place within capitalism itself. Okay, so the real response is to confront capitalism realism, the idea that there is no alternative to capitalist neoliberal agendas. And by extension, confront Anthropocene realism, the idea that there can be no end, no alternative to petrocapitalism, the push to extract every last drop of oil out of the ground. It is now accepted that human-made climate change is inevitable and that neoliberalism is at its crisis point, but our narratives of the good life remain tied to geographies of racial exclusion and bound up in petrocapitalism. But is climate change an accepted fact? Should we talk about the elephant in the room? The egomaniacal, racist, sexist, asinine, sniffling, farting elephant in the room? I wasn't gonna go there. Too soon. But Trump's recent election threatens to unravel all aspects of climate action agendas and his vows to cancel the Paris Climate Agreement, populate his cabinet with oil industry execs and allies. His promise for a drill baby drill energy policy are based on a deep and loud denial of any sort of climate catastrophe. And so denialism is a very real response to climate change. The real response to climate change is, denialism. is despair. While we are stuck here between denialism and despair, I would like to return to the somewhat unpopular idea that perhaps the world, this planet we call Earth, is not ours to save. As the planet recedes from the image of the world's givenness to human thought and analysis, realism becomes exposed as another ambit of human philosophical privilege. And the attempted disappearance of what realism cannot find, that is, the gap between the given world and the world of culture from human thought. If anything, our knowledge of climate change has produced a derealization of human scale, time, and history, and in turn we have begun to witness the futility of the realist impulse. Meanwhile, back on Earth, materialist framings can provide a more adequate view of the way the world actually
actually works, by challenging the hubris of the human subject and providing a base for alternative visions of human agency. But doesn't this just return us to the triumph of lived organicity, a vitalism that merely correlates the materiality of the planet to meanings, utilities, and aesthetic references for this us? This return to thinking life as an affirmation of affects and material difference, the appeal to some sort of fundamental stratum of non-conceptual self-evidence, not only privileges vitalism as a primary condition for life, but it also fails to question why thought should be made to return to effective and embodied forms of existence in the face of non-human, non-organism vectors of planetary transformation, geotrauma, and extinction that is coextensive of the Anthropocene. There was a time and there will be a time without humans. The encroaching event of extinction makes apparent that what we are is not something essential. Put bluntly, the necessity of prolonging the human as an image of thought implicitly worth preserving must be put to question. So back to learning to die. Not just learn to die, but focus on mitigating the current situation instead of saving humanity for some transcendent future. Or we can support and advocate for the acceleration and redirection of technolo technological yes, interventions. Yes, to avoid the slow fragmentation towards primitivism, perpetual crisis, and planetary ecological collapse. Or we can come to terms with climate debt and actually work towards reconciliation. We need to contract our use of resources and change our economic models and rules. Or we can go to war. But to fight, we need a better conception of how ecological degradation and political change are intimately entwined. Which also involves challenging the stupidity of institutionalized science and its attachments to unfettered progress. Or we can just deny... Or get real, get material. We must examine climate change through a lens that shifts its focus from human-centric worlds to interspecies performative realities. Or finally, we can acknowledge that the necessity of prolonging the human as an image of thought might not even be worth preserving. Perhaps we need to refuse all of these responses when the questions to which they answer are answers for nobody, answers for whoever, rather than answers for us, for all of us. With this in mind, the present, my presentation will begin to unfold. Full, that's my time. <laughs>